Welcome to Experience Focused Leaders. I'm delighted to introduce to you Greg Head, software industry veteran, particularly CRM software with three startups under his belt, including an IPO success story. Uh, uh, Greg has been in the traditional kind of venture-backed software tech universe, and now he's actually pioneering a new way of thinking about technology startups through his Pat Practical Founders community podcast where he's advice and, and peer group where he's advising 40 SaaS founders on how to build a capital efficient business. Greg, welcome to the pod. Uh, great to be here, Alex. So let's start with the uh, the the subject near and dear to my heart, the uh, CRM industry. One of my first introductions to tech was uh, right. working at a place called Salesforce right yeah. at the time, right, right around the IPO time as an intern. And when we are looking at ACT and we are trying to, yeah. you know, we're still competing with that world. Yeah. Obviously, mm -hmm. the world has changed. You've mm -hmm. done a few uh, CRM startups uh, even since then. So tell us a little bit of how do you see a uh, bird's eye view over a long career in the in this one particular category? What's yeah. changed? What remained the same? I think people, uh, you know, people are probably more curious in particular what has not changed because everybody assumes <laughs> everything has changed, right? But yeah. some things are probably re still the same. I would be, love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, it's actually one of the things that I think about. I'm very active in the software business. Now I'm helping. I'm inside uh, 40 different uh, modern SaaS software companies. And I talk to hundreds of founders and, uh, and investors every year. I'm very active. But I spent 30 years building software companies. And uh, starting in the early 90s with Act Software, uh, yeah. which was one of the first software Products used by millions of salespeople all over the world in the early 90s, got salespeople on their laptops for the first time and helped start a company called Sales Logics in the early and the mid 90s when sales teams were starting to use software and uh, buying and growing companies and, you know, two companies to 100 million in revenues. And in the 2011, 2015 timeframe, I was the chief marketing officer of Infusionsoft. So that was sales, CRM, and yeah. marketing automation for small businesses. So, and you took it from 15 types. to 100 million. So that was a pretty yeah. amazing journey. Yeah. So and so I played in this sales software, in CRM software game, even before it was called CRM, and the sales and marketing game, they're all kind of coming together. So uh, and I've run software businesses. I've been the marketing leader, the product leader, uh, mm -hmm. the evangelist, uh, the kitchen table to working inside, you know, owning a big P&L inside a big uh, public company with uh, hundreds of employees that report to me. So I've done all kinds of things and I'm still really curious about it. And what has changed and what hasn't changed is a really important question for marketers, for entrepreneurs. And for anybody, you know, playing the game and uh, trying to create something bigger in the world. So tactics have changed. The world has changed. The internet has come and we've seen different phases of it. Social media, marketing, technology, tracking. Uh, we had sales software in the 90s. We didn't have marketing software, but we have plenty of marketing software these days of all types. So, and the tactics, the what works today to... Uh, find potential customers, engage with them, convert them. All of that is really kind of changing all, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, and unfortunately, in the marketing game, it's if something works, it kind of gets popular and then beaten to death. So there's very few tactics left. Yeah. That, well, that's, that's uh, one, yeah. Of, one of our guests who founded uh, and was the CEO of Eloqua. Yes. Uh, oh, great. Sure. Uh, who who you know, Mark yeah. Organ. He yeah. said uh -huh. one of my favorite quotes that I repeat now: "Marketers ruin any party they get invited to." And I think that yeah. that that sounds like the yeah. abuse of a tactic um, right. is a is a prevailing one. So it sounds like that there's the sort of the short the short term live right the the of a tactic is even increasing right like as it used to be that you yeah. could run something for a few years. And now these tactics expire 
in in six months, a year cycle? Is right. that kind of what you take us? Yeah, and it moves pretty fast because in the old days, we had different tactics, television ads or direct mail or mm -hmm. uh, whatever, magazine ads and, you know, door to door or whatever, just way back when. But uh, these days in the digital world where marketers meet potential customers and uh, attract and convert, uh, technologies are cheaper, easier, broader, the, you know, these weapons of, of, uh, marketing mass destruction get easily, you know, there's, you, it's easy to push the button and scale it and, uh, they get killed pretty quickly here, but you know, that's, those are the things that have, uh, e even in the software business, some things haven't changed and some things have changed. One of the things that has changed is that it's easier to make software. It's easier to go to market than it was even 10 years ago almost by a factor of 10, if you know what you're doing. So you don't need venture capital to get going. And venture capital funds are three times as big. And so they're actually more risky. So one of the things that has changed in the software industry is that most software companies don't require venture capital to get up and running these days and uh, and to grow and be successful. Uh, and so that has changed uh, in the game. Mm -hmm. So I'm helping those founders uh, generally stay off the funding drugs or use it very appropriately. It's just got overcooked. And we'll, we'll come back to this. Yeah, yeah. This is an so, important topic. So in so, the marketing so, game, yeah. what hasn't mm -hmm. changed, Alex, is that our brains haven't changed. They haven't changed in thousands of years. We're still we crocodiles. Stories. Is that what you're saying? We're, still, we're crocodiles that pay attention to movement well, and emotional no, creatures. I think we hear things in the same way. Yeah. Whether it's a digital or an ad or a social media or whatever, we hear stories, mm -hmm. the narrative model of uh, tell me something, tell me something interesting and, you know, uh, take me through the hero's journey um, is uh, universal and simple and doesn't change. Uh, and the narrative model still works and it's maybe harder than ever, but uh, applying that through all these new tactical media is a, is a trick. I also think positioning in the classic sense with by Al Reese and Jack Trout, mm -hmm. who created the word, uh, marketing, I think branding is a bad word, actually has a bad brand. Positioning, I think, is real. What is it? Who is it really for? What does mm -hmm. it really do for them? How is it different? Which one are you is one of the most important things that entrepreneurs and marketers can do not just go grab somebody by the collar and pull them in and try to sell them, but be known as the best at something important for someone specific is still, which is a modern way to say the positioning game, uh, be a leader at something important for someone specific. It still hasn't changed. Uh, and that old product adoption life cycle at the beginning early adopters who are kind of crazy and curious and interested play with it before normal people do. That's also hasn't changed. Uh, maybe it moves a little faster these days, but uh, that hasn't changed as well. Those are the human, let's say psychological and sociological dynamics that uh, can be played for good or for evil, <laughs> you know, by marketers or politicians or whomever. Interesting. So I, you know, and I would probably even throw out there that positioning in a noisier environment is even more critical oh, yeah. than in a less noisy environment, right? So as yeah. the environment is crowded with massive uh, marketing distra distractions, yeah. right? <laughs> the yeah. positioning game is critical. But one yeah. of the things that you brought up, right, like on the adoption, that's I think is very interesting. Obviously, you were pioneering it. Was some yeah. some of that was ACT was like people being yeah, able yeah, to yeah. buy mm -hmm. and download ACT, but product led growth, right? Like that sort of is a buzzword. Yeah. Um, uh, frankly, you know, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint were product led uh, solutions uh, the way they started out. So again, it's not a completely new thing, but it's yeah, become yeah. a buzzword. And I'm yeah, curious yeah. as to what's the implication of that in terms of buyer expectations. And generally, you know, what's the impact of that on the investment necessity, as you said, right? Because if it's easier to build a product, mm -hmm. right, then the distribution becomes 
critical in a noisy world. Right. And then the question becomes is, you know, is can you build cost efficient distributions, right? Or do you just need yeah. to put investment resources into distribution more than you need in the product development? Well, uh, those are a few things there. So the yep. um, attraction, marketing, distribution, sales games, um, you have some of the same core principles, product-led growth. The product itself creates an experience where p the spreading occurs from the product, just like Uber. We heard it from other people who used it. Uh, and the experience of using and buying the product happens, generally speaking, without talking to a salesperson. So that's the modern version of product-led growth. And in fact, ACT in the early 1990s was something that soft people found on the shelf. I need something to manage my contacts and sell more. And uh, literally the box and the CD and the, you know, the discs and all that kind of stuff. But there was product-led growth because people gave that you know, their disc to somebody else and said, this is awesome. Try this yeah. Yeah. without talking to them. Word spread, uh, marketing. And word of, I guess word of mouth. It was word of mouth. Probably is probably that. that yeah. And, uh, but that? also the, they could experience the product on their own without talking to people and all that. So mm -hmm. the modern version is, uh, like any, uh, free software that you use, or you can just run up and try it yourself. Um, that's the modern version. And that's the antithesis of the big enterprise software uh, that Salesforce railed against. Uh, you know, Salesforce was almost uh, product led. You didn't have at the beginning. Yeah. Enterprise at the beginning, salesperson, was, you could just go yeah. to the website and try yeah, it yourself. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, and they now, eventually I, they cut it off. Right. And became yeah. very enterprise. Well, now Salesforce but, is the evil enterprise, yeah. you know, Borg. Uh, these days. And there are a lot yeah. of successful CRM sales and marketing software companies where people say, I know what I want. And they can literally go to the website, learn for themselves, get a trial, get the free version. And the user uh, can drive the uh, conversion, not some uh, heavy handed salesperson or sales process or even assisted sales. So um, I, I think that it's a it doesn't always work. It's not, there's no one formula and product, everything, everybody's going product led. There's still a lot of things that need uh, a discussion that consultative sale or advised, uh, advised, you know, connection people in the process uh, before buying to get a demo, to see if this is the right thing. Uh, big complex software still needs people to have big complex conversations and so forth. But when, you know, uh, over time, more and more things become, I don't want to say commoditized, but at least known. The position and the market adoption is uh, well known. Everybody needs one of these things. And the product-led growth game, the do it for yourself or try it yourself for free, um, can be very efficient for uh, practical founders. Uh, you do need a lot of volume. You knew, do need let's say hundreds of thousands of tries to get tens of right. thousands of demos to get uh, thousands of paying customers to get hundreds of paying customers who pay a lot. So it works in that kind of model where big crowds, like a lot of people it has are to be mature. It, category. Yeah. it has to be mature category. You have to be able yeah, to most of the time, time. most yeah. of the time. So let, yeah. let's actually, so, so let's pinpoint that is, is the, emergence of these new maybe more efficient buying channels like mm -hmm. product led yeah is that enabling this practical founder movement that yeah. you're advocating for yeah. or are you finding that hey a lot of my practical founders are you know niche solution for enterprise right and they just mm -hmm. niche down and it's very efficient to get you know yes 100k deals up front Yes. Right. And then and then maybe experiment with other dimensions as the product matures. Right. So like especially historically, that's not, I would say majority is like, hey, let's start very low end. And then over time, we move up yeah, into yeah. the enterprise. Right. That's the classical. Play. That's what Salesforce but did. That's what Salesforce, but tends to be a VC backed play for some of the reasons. It's hard to get a perfect uh, product. Perfect. And then the distribution volume. You know, is still competitive even if you're trying to acquire product 
generated leads, right? You need to get them in somehow. And that, that doesn't happen like magic uh, versus the yeah. enterprise sales, right? And that also has its own expenses. And so I, I'm a bit um, of two minds, actually. Like yeah, what's the, what's yeah. the, what is there, like when you look at the peer group, maybe the people you advise and yeah, then yeah. tens yeah. of thousands, is it leaning towards product led or is it leaning towards mid-market enterprise as an initial step right. into the market? Well, here's how I see it as somebody who literally was in the game uh, for all these years building software companies uh, right there, um, building global scalable uh, companies from startup to scale. And, you know, I'm talking to 500 founders a year about what's working in their business and how they're approaching their funding and their end game. So here's how I see it. Uh, 20 years ago, you needed 10 engineers or 20 engineers to go build a Windows software product that worked on servers, the box, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Salesforce kind of changed that with the new web software. But um, even then, back then, you needed a lot of uh, engineers. So you needed to raise venture capital to get the product built to go to market. Then you needed to raise another venture capital round to go do marketing expensively with ads and then build a sales force that would go knock on doors in enterprise right. or, you know, you had to spend big money to get out there. Uh, these days, you don't need to do either of those in most cases. In some cases you do, and VC funding isn't bad. It's just overprescribed and generally misunderstood by founders. But there are way more options for serious software founders to go to market efficiently and fund their growth, 30, 40, 50, even 100% growth, with customer revenues, not outside funding. So uh, mm -hmm. funded along the way. Product-led growth is one of those. To do paid ads that convert efficiently or SEO that converts efficiently to high volume traffic that tries out your product. And many of those buy if your product's good. So that's a high standard. But there are other ways to go to market efficiently and it's kind of a myth that if I have VC funding, I can go to market efficiently. Nobody is advertising their way into a market successfully. Mm. Nobody is doing the old PR handshake thing and getting the press like you know used to 20 years ago. There's a product-led growth is one of the tactics in that mm -hmm. toolbox, but there are other tactics. For instance, I am active on LinkedIn and I'm a effectively a LinkedIn influencer. I get 2 million views of my LinkedIn posts every 90 days. I have effectively, I mean, it's not free. I'm, I do the work to do right. it, but I don't need to raise VC funding or crack the book publishing game to go get an audience of, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, people in the software game. I can reach those people and get in a conversation and engaging and, and get them to my website. That's one way to do it. In vertical markets, which are very efficient, there's three trade shows that everybody goes to. The people in your market are identified. You can partner with the four partners that work with everybody who's the profile that you sell to. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to do it. Um, the, the, the VC model for big B2B enterprise is we raise money and you add a lot of salespeople and the salespeople go out there and blanket the big companies and surround them and start selling. Uh, that model is tactically difficult these days, but uh, you know, it still works if you're selling, you know, hundred thousand a year to a million dollar a year of software. Um, it's just uh, not as required. So there's other ways to, I don't even call these hacks. They're just efficient channels that you can't buy. Let's say they're more earned in some right. ways. Um, so, know. so for you, what you're saying, LinkedIn for you is earned channel because yeah. you have yes. three decades of experience, right? Yeah. You, you I'm were investing CMO, in you know, you're, creating you're a crowd. investing yeah. in it, right? You're building and long term, you're you're thinking of not just an audience, but a community of yeah. that you're building, yeah. right? And so, therefore, it's a good investment, right? But Let's say somebody's in a rush, right? Resource constraint, mm -hmm. and they don't have two years to build the LinkedIn audience. Yeah. Right. Are, so, what are you finding 
that are you said ha the word hacks right everybody's looking for a magical hack you know of cost yeah. efficient channels and also i'm kind of curious <clears throat> are you only seeing practical like the startup founders being interested in this cost efficient uh, go to market uh, approach or are you seeing corporates that are looking to innovate and build new products experiment with new areas are they adapting some of the same uh, techniques, especially in this environment as well? Well, there's a couple of things there. So I'll generalize. Big companies don't innovate like creative, frontline, uh, edgy entrepreneurs. Okay. It's an advantage for the small companies that don't have billion dollar quotas that they can do things uh, creatively and differently. Uh, if you need, if you just need to get 50 new customers this year who pay you 10,000 a year, that's half a million revenue. Uh, there's all kinds of savvy ways to do that, that don't require, uh, a huge marketing team engine and the technology and a big media spend. Uh, it used to be that the big guys could outspend, outscale, out infrastructure, the little guys, they just kind of own that. But in the modern technology game, we want to hear from authentically from people mm -hmm. uh, who can reach us with a unique and valuable message for us. And the big companies tend not to do that as much. They do have the position as the leader like Salesforce, but they're easily easy to position against. That's actually one of the fastest ways uh, for product-led growth and other new companies is, is to position against the leader. Uh, as Salesforce got into market, it was the anti-enterprise right. software in the beginning, and they filled up stadiums of people who were interested in that. And then uh, now it's easy to pos position against Salesforce. And the number one uh, easy thing to do is to say, Salesforce is great, but it's for big companies. If you're one of 30,000 insurance agencies in the United States, those offices that, you know, that broker insurance uh, yeah. for uh, local customers, uh, it's easy to position against Salesforce. We're just for, uh, in a positioning kind of way, we're just for insurance agents. We do what you just need. You don't need to pay for all this extra stuff. You're, you know, we solve your whole problem, data, language, training, whatever, that kind of thing. So um, I, I, there's all kinds of ways to do it, product-led growth and the rest. Uh, I think there's kind of a myth that, Funding can help you uh, get to product market fit faster, find your best customer and build the product that's unique to them because uh, that takes a little time and finesse. And when you raise money, you lose time and you lose finesse. Money is a brute force uh, tool. Uh, funding is. Uh, it's like hurry up and get there. And uh, I would say if you could find an efficient uh, channel, uh, that if you could put more oomph behind it, sometimes paid ads work. If you have high conversion and really works, uh, you can raise money and scale on that. Uh, or uh, if you have a vertical market kind of outbound approach that works or whatever. But uh, one of the reasons the practical founder methods staying off of VC funding and you still creating a, a, a valuable company uh, that works these days is because the uh, go-to-market tactics that are just brute force, spend more, you know, we need 10 times more leads this year, uh, don't work as well as they used to. Right. So the saturation yeah. is not is not helping and the creativity doesn't scale necessarily. So that's you, true. That's true. Size, size is the advantage, right? Like, mm -hmm. in, like in the in the small organization. But also size brings its own problems, right? And I think yeah. one of them is, you know, if you're small and you you are experimenting and trying to find where the market is heading, right? You may yeah. not have the enough resources to experiment, right? Which is frustrating. I could certainly feel that tension. Hey, yeah. we're small. We have big, big vision. We, we're still at a stage where we want to, you know, draw in the big audience and see who who is the ideal customer, yeah. Um, and maybe some of them will be ideal down yeah. the road, but like, so, but there's that discovery process. Right. The challenge was it 
uh, have, have something go someone going through this is that you know the, this this is the antithesis of focus right you're being curious you're seeing yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. directions right? right so the conventional vc advice is focus 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 maybe have a plan b i've heard like some yeah. more sophisticated people say well you focus on this market but you probably want to have like another market kind of ready to go but that's about it right like that sort of is the yeah. conventional wisdom and i think you you're i heard one of your podcasts where you're articulating a little bit more nuanced views so like up until a certain stage you do want to experiment and then yeah. you, you actually then you narrow down and i thought that yeah. was really helpful and not something you frequently hear so let's well i'm a big focus that. guy so yeah. to grow a serious company yeah it's a law of nature that you can't be more things to more people as you grow fast. Right. What happens is you start out thinking you're everything for everybody. Yes. You mm -hmm. start trying them and you see these things work and yeah. you start, stop doing the other things that focus. Every restaurant uh, owner could make any kind of food. Any chef can make any kind of food in their restaurant by the end of the week, Thai ice cream, Italian, French, uh, you know, whatever, any kind of food, hamburgers, but they don't. And the ones that scale globally, nationally are the ones that are known for a very specific kind of food. Uh, it's the same with any product or politician or musician right. or the rest. So, but the experimentation zone of startups, startups are experiments. I don't, is it, is it this kind of thing for these kind of people? Or is it this kind of thing for these kind of people? What you said about focus, focus, focus and v VCs and big funding and Silicon Valley style venture capital funding. Uh, require focus, meaning they're waiting on the other side of you running your experiments, saying we tried and all this, then, and right. we know we have product market fit. We have this product for this market, and they love it. And they say, well, what about all these others? And they said, no, this is the best one. We're focused here. We're going to be known as the best here. Okay, we can invest now because there's something that uh, you can sell efficiently. Well, investors. right. Except for except for there, there's a little twist, right? And I think you've highlighted it, but let me mm -hmm. correct me if I'm misreading. Yeah. It. The twist is the the overfunding in the early stages that has happened recently, yeah. but it's still to some degree happening. Mm -hmm. Is happening so early in the process when the founders barely know what the hell they're doing, right? They may have right. a product out, they don't know who's yeah. their ideal customer, they don't know the right channels to pursue them. They right. have not had a year to see if those guys stick around and, and girls as customers and become referenceable and, yeah. and bring in you, but they're like, they already raised three mil. And the next one is, you know, 10 mil. And they're, they're kind of on the sort of on the, an addiction journey. And so they're going, it feels like they could be going down the wrong um, thought the wrong directions because they haven't done that experimentation stage mm -hmm. and something could be okay, right? It could be working somewhat, but it doesn't end up venture scaling. And so then you end up having these like dramatic pivots and, yeah. you know, I have yeah, it's very common. And friends have done them because they've already yeah. gone on the venture thing. And yeah. the only way you can make that work if you bat it or you know throw it all in the red, <laughs> which is the pivot, right? And roll the dice and hope that pivot works. Yeah. And it feels really tragic, actually, because there's a some yes. gem of a good idea, but got overfunded. Is that what you're like advocating against that early funding before That's you know what mostly you do? what happens? Okay. In the software industry. With modern VC funding, they can't give you a little bit to try. Their funds are so big, they have to give you a lot. The economics of the fund are... The funds got bigger, so there's no such size, thing as a yeah. little bit, and we'll yeah. be patient with you. It's, yeah. I just raised a billion dollars, or yeah. $100 million, or $500 million, and I got to place bets, and they got to win and hurry up. So if you get those kind of funding, and you're not ready to hurry up, the rocket fuel, if you don't have a rocket that you've built... And that's ready to go, that if you put rocket fuel on it, it will go forward as you anticipate. If you put rocket fuel in something, that's the startup experiment. We got no good idea, but we don't know yet. And you forget rocket fuel. I think half the time it's like you, you're pumping diesel, you know, diesel fuel yeah. into gasoline tanks, right? Like you're like, yeah. I don't think if some some of yeah. it is like before even rocket fuel stage, right? It's 
it's kind of like it almost feels like it's even before that right that the yeah. you get well that marketers is- know this too is you yeah. do you test before you scale right. and you try a lot of things if you have the capability and you're creative modern marketer with your team but you have things in your scale up you know uh, engine and you have things in your startup innovation engine and what these startups are is all innovation it's it's new thing for you know a new crowd and you're trying to figure it out so what's most important to software entrepreneurs the innovators in this experimentation zone of almost anything isn't hurry up, get to 10 million in revenue, figure out what works, you know, um, hire fast, uh, put all the money on red. That doesn't work. What works is a more patient approach. And Mm. like the lean startup described it, where you say, I think it's this, but it may not be. We tried it. We tried three things. Okay. That's better than this. And that's what we learned here that you need time and tries to figure out what works. And what I'm seeing over and over again, Alex, Mm. is if I sell an idea and VCs kind of make you say, I know what the answer is before founders know what the answer is because they need the rate. They're looking for the answer. So founders say, I've got the answer and they don't have the answer yet. And the rocket fuel comes and everything blows up. Most VC funded companies blow up. They don't, they half of them that are funded uh, fail outright. Another twenty five percent don't pay payback investors. So it's that kind of game there. But um, I see it over and over again. I didn't quit my day job. I have this other business over here. Uh, this doesn't need to get to a million revenue in six months. I'm going to keep trying. The reason that I have. Uh, tens of thousands of followers on LinkedIn as rest as I've been playing this game and seeing what works for, for several years and, uh, and developing a tribe and, a you know, a reputation and improving my content and, you know, all the kinds of things that if I needed to do that in 20 minutes, I couldn't do so. And I can't buy my way there. Uh, buyers don't want, by the way, buyers don't want people who bought their way there. They want authentic, you know, validated, uh, you know, solutions that are built just for them, which is, uh, again, hasn't changed there. So um, it's not to say that VC funding can't work. It just usually doesn't. And in the modern VC model and the modern go-to-market and software building model, uh, funding too early is uh, over-prescribed and misunderstood. And and I would almost argue, and I think you would, I hope you would agree is that the modern VC, I think, because you're using that word, modern VC yeah. does not operate the same way that traditional VC did. Traditional VC yeah. was a little bit more measured. It wasn't an overnight. It was a little more practical in the old it days. Was, literally, it was more. It was yeah. more pragmatic. Exactly. It kind of yeah. had stages, and it wasn't overfunded. Yeah, but there's the riches. You know, this happens, and there's another human factor we could say that hasn't changed. Yeah. Right. Let's say the greed, the greedy. scale, the ego. There's a lot of ego plays, all those humans things that uh, are natural. And, uh, you know, I'm not immune to it myself. Um, and it happens in a lot of uh, industries, the big industrial complex. All of a sudden we perceive that it's the only way to do it. And in fact, it's almost never works. And, uh, you know, it's very rare when you get an exit and it's not the most common way that software companies are started. Um, and it's not the best way to grow for most founders, but it looks like it. So yeah, the VC funding game has changed. They're hurry up and get me to, you know, um, raise more money, keep going. That's quite painful right now for most funded founders out there. So Alex, I know it's difficult in your business, right? Trying to build the product and find customers and run an experiment. And, you know, it's very challenging. I totally understand that. It's worse and will end and it will lower your odds if you said I got two or three million dollars in funding from an impatient investor. And I don't think that, you know, if you knew what your game was and you had a rocket ready for rocket fuel, I'm not against that. But um, so it's, that's the key you know. word, right? I think like you're not counter VC. I think you just need to know what game you're playing. Be, yeah. You know, open eyed. And I think the the biases that I think most founders get is from the press, right? Because it's the. TechCrunch stories, 
Yeah. It's the venture announcement that people yeah. congratulate you on. Yeah, They're it's kind the of ecosystem ego too, whether right? you're ego. in Paris or Silicon Valley yeah. or Dallas or whatever. They're kind of oriented around, I call it the funding industrial complex. They're kind of yeah. oriented around get funding, spend funding on us, the events, the pitch events, yeah. the people on stage, I raise funding, yeah. so forth. So there's this clapping for funding, which is kind of like, you know, clapping for, I'm just taking a major prescription that right. has very high risks, you know. Um, where's where, where's like there's not that much nobody's going it's kind of implied but nobody's going oh great i'm getting really intimate with my customers i'm really getting in yeah really all getting that complicated stuff right. which is right. i tried seven things and now yeah. i figured this angle of my product and this corner of my product for this corner of this market oh my gosh they love it and it took us you know 18 months to figure that out and now you know uh the milestone that people should be clapping for is I I got through my experimentation phase and I'm starting to build a more scalable recurring revenue SaaS company yeah. and I got to a million dollars of recurring revenue and and we're, we're focusing in. That's where we yeah. should be clapping. That's, that's, that's where the flywheel of a almost unscrew upable business uh, in software uh, starts. And it's really messy before then, funded or not. And it's hard after that, uh, funded or not, but that's where the milestone is. And these recurring revenue flywheel businesses that have happy customers who stay a long time and tell their friends, product market fit, as it's called, um, you know, those are very valuable. This is why software companies are valued at multiples of revenue, not multiples of profit, is because they're really hard to kill. Um, and if you grow them 20% a year, all of a sudden, they're, you know, market leaders, not in the same pace that VC funded, uh, you know, money needs you to perform. Well, let's talk about the value, right? And how that value gets calculated. So there is kind of the exit market, as in uh -huh. somebody buys your company. Yep. And there was this buzz of one overfunded company buying another slightly yeah. less overfunded company. And yeah. it sort mm -hmm. of worked, I think, for a period of time. That worked. And I think now there is private equity buyers. There's still strategic buyers, the IPO yep. market. You know, you've been in a public company. I've been in a public company. What's your take of what's changing uh, with the dynamics of exit? Yeah. Let's assume that it's always been true that if you build a, an amazing business, there's going to be any an exit opportunity for it. Yeah. Right. But there's a lot of these sort of less amazing, slightly problematic businesses. Right. Are they falling out of favor now in terms of acquisition options because they've been either over-invested in or they're yeah. just nobody wants to buy them for, for some of these fundamental flaws that you're describing? Well, there's a few things there. So uh, in the maturity, because now the software as a service, recurring revenue, modern web-based software is uh, the model has matured quite a bit since it was kind of invented 20 years ago. Um they're very sophisticated, very mature buyers of these flywheel, steady growing businesses at all sizes, not just billion dollar businesses and so forth. So um, we also had the run up uh, 2018, 19 of interest and funding and valuations and uh, hype around these software as a service companies. And then 2020, 2021, the bubble, it was literally a bubble. It wasn't just a surge. It was crazy time uh, for using software, for funding software companies, for selling software companies. So that was an anomaly. And now we're back to a little bit more normal time. So a few things have changed in the last uh, 10 years uh, in software. You can sell a two or three or $5 million recurring revenue software business for multiples of revenue, like four to 10, uh, and you didn't used to be able to sell a little company like that. But since they're flywheels and they're going, there's a very active market that says, I'll take your flywheel and I'll grow it and I'll sell it again and so forth. So that's one thing that changed. Uh, the bubble is we're no longer in a bubble. So most companies that IPO'd are valued less. Most companies that have public stock are valued much less. Uh, funding is less and so forth. So generally companies get acquired, bootstrapped or funded, get acquired by other funded companies. 
big PE backed companies, public companies, Microsoft, Google, and the rest. So, you know, you know, in the end, the public markets or the funded markets kind of drive some of the acquisition markets. So there's all kinds of flavors and ways to sell a software company. Uh, if you raise big funding and you do your 3 million round, your 10 million round, your 20 million, you know, $50 million round, and you keep uh, upping and growing, you need to sell your company for 500 million or a billion dollars, public or whatever. Otherwise, founders really lose. Like they could literally sell the company for $300 million and the founders and employees cannot make anything in the deal. The investors make all the money. So you really have to win big in the VC funded game or it's go big or go home. So that's kind of the game. But for practical founders who've built a, a, a software company, there's all kinds of options. The average on my practical founders podcast, I interviewed 70 founders in the last year, and the average exit value, or the value of the company they created if they haven't sold it, is $50 million for the founder, which almost <laughs> very few uh, funded software founders walk away with a prize like that mm. after they raised VC funded and suffered the slings and arrows and so forth. So, um, and these are just, normal, you know, there's way more of that going on than people can see. So um, it's really interesting. There's, you know, it's just a hit market hidden in plain sight that's uh, that's out there. So uh, I wrote about it in my ebook uh, that yeah. I have on my practicalfounders.com website. You can download it for free, 60 page ebook, the seven success paths for practical founders to talk about strategic exits and private equity exits and growth equity exits. You sell a little bit now and sell more later, um, including run in forever profitably or take yeah. out a lot of profits. So one of the ways to succeed in this game and quote exit, take money off the table for a founder is to grow a five or $10 million business and then take three or $5 million out of it every year for, for years. I mean, you don't actually have to exit and you know, that's making more money than 90% of VCs make a year. So it's well, really this interesting. Is, this is what's a great going book. Yeah. And actually I want to quote, quote a part of it that kind of aligns oh, with this. Uh, the happiest founders I know yeah. are the ones who own independent, profitable companies and don't have any big VC funding. Your yeah. optionality and patience are your superpowers yes. to maximize the success path that works best for you and your business. And effectively, that's what I think you're you're kind of highlighting on the exit part. If you don't need to exit, yeah, if you don't have that pressure. Yeah, you're just and hopefully you're working on something that you're passionate about and deeply yeah. find enjoying and not killing yourself to please an investor with some sort of made up growth plan that uh, you know typically doesn't. I don't know not if it's hopefully it is what happens if you yeah. can build a sustainable software company. It's amazing when you do yeah. creative things with your team and your customers and people are happy and you know. Uh, so people say, well, we'd like to buy your company. And you say, well, make an offer. And they give you a lowball offer. And you say, no, thanks. I don't need to spend five minutes with you. Like, let's let's keep going, right? Like, I'm going to double the business in a, one or two or three or 10 years anyway. So, you know, I don't have to do anything. And in fact, when you sell a company to a strategic mm. uh, or when, to a private equity investor, it's it's no longer your company. The founder has to go find something else to do. And it generally screws up the company. All that culture and you know uh, charm that you've built up, all that knowledge generally gets dissipated. You know, uh, My buddies at Eloqua, when uh, it was sold in, I think, 2008 to Oracle, the, the old, I used a, an old joke. So here's another thing that hasn't changed. Uh, what do you get when you cross Eloqua and Oracle? The acquired with the acquirer. So I would ask my buddies at Eloqua and Oracle. They would say, what do you get when you cross Eloqua and Oracle? A lot clerk, you know, and I'm like, no, you get Oracle. And they went, <laughs> exactly. Five minutes after showing up there, it's no longer Eloqua. All that charm, founder goes away, the, you know, the climbing the hill, the quest, everything else, it just goes into the machine. And if it doesn't fit in the machine, it's going to die. So that happens. What do you get when you cross Figma and Adobe? One of the big deals. You get well, Adobe. You, you get you get a currently uh, yeah. a legal case, whether right. it's even so, going to happen. For but those of right. us that right. love yeah. to build yeah. great products and get happy customers and build amazing teams and and really clever businesses, 
it's never been a better time to grow a soft, create and grow a software company, a valuable software company uh, right now, if you can do it without big funding, which is most because you don't need to get on it. What you fundamentally you're saying, you no longer need to be on a hamster wheel. You just need to be creative yeah. and scrappy. Right. And there yeah. are, there are simpler ways to build a product and to go to market on a product. And it, it actually requires you to be savvier. There's a myth that the smart guys raise funding and the C students don't raise funding. Sorry, bootstrapper. You weren't yeah. part of the cool kids. Now, if you're smart enough to go to market and get to product market fast and run the tests and build a team and be super efficient, uh, like if you're savvy enough, you can stay off the funding drugs. And what's happening now in a lot of tech centers is this um, indigestion from the overfunding of 20, 20, 21, uh, is kind of running its course. Yeah. Companies are shutting down the gun to the head, kicking out founders, uh, laying off employees. It's really kind of no fun in Silicon Valley right now um, at big companies and a lot of small ones. And a lot of founders are saying that didn't work. There's got to be a better way. So I'm out here waving my hands. And I, as I did during the run up, you, 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 you don't don't take it. It's not going to end well. And there's a better way to do it. So, um, so on that note, so let, yeah. let's let's dig into this because actually, one of the things that opened my eyes, uh, looking yeah. at the space around content, in particular, that where you know we we focus yeah. on was my my own startup. It turned out that many of the more successful companies now that are kind of poster child for success. One I would say is Webflow, kind of no code yeah. mm -hmm. success story. We we know we love the founders, the the, yeah. the business they build, but it it was actually a third version of a yes. content management system built by the same founders. It raised some a little bit of money that went into that experimentation phase for a really long time. Yeah, and um, fundamentally was not an overnight success story by any stretch of imagination yeah, even though very few kind of things old, are yeah, what is right. why why does it need to be yeah well Ooh. i don't know that seems to be the story right canva everybody knows canva yeah. we love canva we have a lot of yeah. users who use yeah. canva turns out you know the founders of canva built a couple other related businesses right before canva right and so they've been Ooh. at it at doing that experimentation owning the problem and yeah. um that Solving the journey. puzzle. You, you if you can solve, solve the overnight, puzzle, right? Like you can't yeah. solve. Like, and what you're saying is VC funding, um, never. Like, like you're saying it doesn't solve it today, but I, one could argue when you really drill into some of these stories, even in the past, it wasn't even solved back then, right? It, like, it was. It, it really those stories just were not advertised because everybody wanted to look like a genius that that mastered it you know, overnight. Yeah. And I mean, let's say it is possible to raise funding in, you know, in the early stage, but you kind of like we did with sales logics. I was the product manager for the number one software product for salespeople in the world in 1995, six, where I quit my job. And with the founder of that product, who sold the company to, to uh, Symantec, what do you get when you cross act in Symantec, right? So we, we, I kind of was in there for a few years. We started a company. I knew exactly what the market wanted. I was literally at the trade shows watching them bounce around between Siebel and all the booths and talking to a crowd in the booth. And the market was evolving that quarter. Sales mm. teams were finally saying, I need one database. I need all my deals in one place. And this was the time that it was actually happening. So we knew if we built a product that got everybody in one database and was, you know, the CRM kind of story, uh, the modern CRM, a precursor of that, that we could sell it. So we raised funding to build it. We raised funding to go to market. We built a channel. We were the mid-market leader there. And uh, it was a wide open market. It was harder to build software. It was easier to find wide open markets. Now it's completely opposite. The puzzle is trickier, but it's figure outable uh, if you get enough time and tries. It's just, if you try to rush it too fast or throw money at it and solve it with paid ads or something like that. It generally doesn't work. There's more, there's more leverage in the business than ever. 
um, for marketers and, you know, and entrepreneurs and the rest. But it also is a, the puzzle is a little trickier. So I so think it takes that, it takes. Yeah. So I, I love that idea that actually the, it takes it, it's more clever to be bootstrapped. Yeah, and, I, um, I actually do and, see this. Yeah. They That's have more product market fit, more mm. tracking, more discipline mm. about their go to market spend and their conversion, uh, which you can have if you're not trying to triple the business every year. If you have mm. modest growth rates, right? You could find the ones who are ready to buy, who won't leave right away, right? You don't have to overcook it. And um, you can be very savvy and very frugal and very efficient. I think founders should raise their leverage in the business, find the leverage and grow off of that and not because they think it's through funding, but it isn't. And Alex, what if I talk to you in a year and your business is growing, you're going to say, we tried this, we tried this, and this worked, and we figured out what the thing was underneath that. And then we turned the product, we moved it over, and we took it out to this, and we found this crowd that says, that, that is absolutely amazing. We closed 100 customers. That's what that turn looks like to, oh, my God, I'm really onto something. But it, you know, this is, the, this is why big companies can't do it, the innovators dilemma. They're not going to try those 17 things and look for the finesse. And, you know, fail 60 times until you find it or yeah. something like that. So it's always there, by the way, that experimentation, you know, phase uh, before and the narrowing down phase. So they're both uh, required. I love it. I think I think I'm writing this down, by the way, like the, the leverage is is really when we think leverage, we think capital. That's that's yeah. fundamentally. And you're saying, yeah. yeah, capital could be leverage in some timing. No, it isn't. That's it's absolute, just acceleration. It's, it's just it's an accelerator. Force. It's not the yeah. yeah, it's not. So that's yeah. very perceptive differentiation. Now, yeah. actually, well, and marketers wanted... and entrepreneurs know this, right? right. If, like one guy, me, is getting two million people to see my posts on LinkedIn because of the clever leverage of the content and the focus. I'm known as the best. It's something important for someone specific for these mm. practical SaaS founders, bootstrappers, and the ones who are getting by with, you know, without VC funding, there's a little funding flavor in there, but I'm the one of the few talking about it. And I'm the you one of the few who's done it. And I'm talking about the real stuff and I'm showing the examples and I'm bringing out the insights and I'm telling it in a way that these people can hear. You couldn't hire five writer, LinkedIn, social media specialist to do what I do. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a person behind this, which is also harder to scale, but, um, you know, I'm winning against, you know, the brute force marketers. The last well, thing. Actually, Alex, let's, yeah. yeah. Well, well, kind of let's drill into the scaling of the founder, right? Because yeah. one of the other quotes that I wanted to highlight from the, from the book, creating and growing a valuable company is usually an, all consuming effort for many no. years. Some founders sacrifice their health, relationships, and families. So you have to define what success means to you so you can choose the best path for that success. Yes. Well, let's talk about that, right? And and mm -hmm. what are you what are the particular challenges to the practical founder or scrappy model where you may not be able to hire the person that's done this before, right? You may have more junior talent that, that has figuring it out along with you and therefore you can't delegate and get some of that leverage how do people yeah. how do you find people are working around that do you find that practical founders are happier as a group yeah. Uh, yeah. or than the ones that are vc backed who could yeah. afford maybe better talent right i could say that it's rare for a practical founder who has customers and revenue and a little team and no outside funding, and they're pretty close to break even. They're not going to run out of money anytime soon. It's rare to find somebody who's miserable. They love this game, and nobody's going to kill them. They got time. It's hard, right? We're all in on this kind of thing. So, uh, and it's almost a rule that if somebody raised VC funding, they're in a stress zone. If I don't get my number, hit my growth number, if this doesn't work, I'm out of business. They're going to shoot me. They're going to, you know, take down the business. Uh, I can't survive without VC funding. So if I don't raise another funding round, I got to close the doors. That's a really brutal stress game. They're both very exciting. They're both hard. Um, in the practical founder zone. So that's a generalization. Like I, that's sure. what I've seen in the last five years, talking to 
three, four thousand founders. The VC funded founders are generally miserable, stressed, and no, it probably won't work. And the bootstrap founders, especially once they're over a certain milestone, a million ARR and uh, not burning cash, they're generally happy. This is a fun game. We love this game. Yeah. So, and they probably, they've gone into it not to, you know, I, th I think a lot of VC founders, at least historically, yeah. they would be kind of an MBA type that said, yeah. oh, I did the analysis of all these markets and I did this. And therefore, I think this is the biggest opportunity that's under yeah, some of the VC funded get, guys are like that. Yeah, some they don't are, care about not. that, yeah. but but yeah. they don't, they may not be as passionate about that particular business. It's just a financial decision of how to allocate. Whereas I think right. a lot of practical founders, I don't think they're thinking like that. They they probably deeply, no. deeply no, they care. care about their customers, this particular yeah. niche that they're going after. Right. This is near yeah. and dear. This is not a financial no, and this is why they're Way just like Steve much. Jobs talks about passion. This is why they're going to keep doing the hard things that normal people won't do is because I care about these early stage founders, my friends, uh, my pals. These are my people. These are the ones who I, these are the crazy ones who I think are going to change the world. And I think it's better for most of them. Uh, and I counsel them, you know, stay off the funding drugs as long as possible. Alex, I would say that to you. If you can get to a million ARR and find your, sweet spot and keep growing from there, you know, I would do everything possible. And there's a line that some things at times is not possible, everything possible to stay off raising two or $3 million from a institutional fund that gets preferred shares and all that game and wants you to get another round. And I, you know, it generally doesn't work uh, that way. So um, uh, the founders, there's, uh, all kinds of ways. The, the other thing about the practical founder game, not raising big VC funding. VC funding, there's one way to do it. Go fast, go or go home. You know, go big or go home. In practical founder land, who you are. I love this industry. I love building slow, steady companies. I love going fast. I'm an extrovert. I'm an introvert. I'm in uh, uh, Copenhagen. I love selling to the Dutch market. I love this industry. Like people can see that I'm showing up and contributing and caring and gifting to the people that uh, I care about, who are the serious SaaS founders and the folks who join them on their quest. So, so there's all kinds of ways to be happy and play the game. That's actually one of the, the ways that I think the practical founder game can win. Uh, women founders, people in different countries, people who don't fit the MBA um, you know, right. fast talking, smart guy, you know, VC funded template, right? They can do it at their own pace. And I, I, I see this all the time, the passion and the pace and the continuous improvement and the steady, and I'm not stopping wins the war more often than not. Uh, in a lot of vertical industries, the legal software market, the dental software market, the buyers, the dentists and the lawyers are sick of the overfunded sales oriented pushers who don't understand their business. They want to buy from savvy dentists who are, you know, built a solution that works way better for them and aren't trying to, you know, crank this thing up and, you know, raise prices on them. Everybody's feeling the funding industrial complex impact on the software that they use to run their businesses. And, you know, they're, uh, stepping back from that. They know when they're being hyper marketed to, right? As opposed and they're and they're looking for the the savvy person to follow there. So uh, well we we love this yeah. part. Like we love the buyer centric experience, yeah. right? Versus yeah. sales centric. And I think when you talk about even just the way people talk about the metrics, it's all about sell, 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 market, 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 MQL to SQL. And I of course that's a measurable um, approach, yeah. but people forget that at the end of the day, you know, the buyer is the king, right? And and how do you create yeah. an experience that draws them in versus you know pushes stuff? And I think the venture approach introduces that risk, right? Because you come, you yeah. bring in people who have done that mass, mass, mass high volume approach, and that is a factory. Their playbook, as you kind of point at like a playbook, and I think. Increasingly, you need a different playbook, right? You need a playbook that draws people yeah. in. 
that or whatever them. playbook works there, you know, yeah. find the leverage in your playbook, right? Find the leverage in your playbook. Now, but I will say this, and I'm curious what your response to it is. Like, so great. Patience is wonderful. We all agree about creativity, experimentation, but people are people. And if there is no pressure, out, external pressure of some kind to do your best performance we tend to drop off we tend to get familiar even entrepreneurs who are driven could get kind of stuck in a hey i've done this it's kind of it's comfortable and you don't push yourself as much this happens obviously to large businesses right they kind of slow down they get comfortable certain yeah. processes get embedded uh, i think one of the advantages of the vc funding model because the returns need to be substantial there's a pressure, right? That to pressure to continue to grow and experiment. And it, you know, sometimes that pressure is helpful because there's there's a big opportunity. There may be competitors coming in. So you do need to move faster in some markets. What's your take on combining this patience and passion and some degree of independence, as you described, mm -hmm. with Hey, let's take the best out of the VC model, right? They're like they're pretty smart. Well, I think the best it. out of the VC model, I don't see any practical founders that are not working hard and pushing hard. Okay. Uh I think uh we just went through with 40 founders what their general vision is for next year. And generally the growth rates across all my 40 founders in my peer group is about 30%, which is what funded companies are growing at right now. Um mm. so and they're all pushing and the rest, but they're not doing unnatural things as founders and in their business and spending and the rest to make it 50% next year, just because they found a healthy rate in there and it's going to be hard. So, you know, they don't have extra people and, and all that kind of thing. So uh, I do think one of the things that founders uh, miss in some take funding and uh, for, for this reason, they don't need the money, but they want the advice and the help. Mm. Um, and Google took funding, not because they needed the money, but because they wanted the best help on the planet for scaling a software company, Kleiner Perkins and the rest. So, uh, so help yeah, I, uh, generally bootstrapped and practical founders uh, spend less and get less um, experienced help. Uh, from, you know, investors can bring help in networks and, you know, they've been through that phase of the growth game before and so forth. So uh, that's generally the thing there. But uh, I think, uh, I think they're, they're not sitting on their laurels. Nobody's sitting on their laurels uh, in this game on the opportunity right. there. They have different so time frames. Like, yeah, uh, yeah I'm going to be a $50 million business, but I don't need to do it in th four years. So like the say, company that I helped start yeah. went from a kitchen table, let's start this yeah. company, to a hundred million in revenues in four and a half years and five hundred employees. It was crazy and it was brutal, and the company effectively isn't around anymore. It wasn't a long-term kind of strategy. We did the rocket ride game and went public and sold it, and you know did all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, there's another way to do it, and you know, all kinds of gradients from ten percent growth to fifty percent growth. Many of the my practical founders are growing 100% a year. So, you know, and they're doing big, complex, you know, heavy solutions. And it's not just these little lightweight little apps. You know, they're they're doing really serious stuff, but they're finding the leverage to be able to do it. So I'm not I'm looking back to the investors. So let's say I'm an investor and I want to yep. uh, propose my capital to a practical founder. Yeah. What do you think the investor should be doing to appeal to this type of founder that does not want to be dependent on the investor? But, you know, the founder is already rich, let's say a million ARR, as you described, right? And they they have mm -hmm. some, some degree of sustainability. They've done the early experimentation phase. What well, would be my I, pitch as an investor yeah. to that type of founder? The traditional VC pitch, the big VC funds, the Silicon Valley funds, and there's a game that's played and there's people who win that game. But uh, that traditional pitch is you need to take five to 15 million because we raise this big fund and we can only invest big chunks. 
And then in five to seven years, you need to sell this for half a billion to a billion dollars, or we'll fire you along the way and we'll change you. And we have preferred shares and you're going to raise more money along the way. That doesn't appeal to these practical founders. They've already bought their independence. They know what they're doing. They know what works uh, and they're not going to screw it up. So that traditional model doesn't work with these kind of founders. And those VCs know it. I know those VCs and they're like, yeah, I know these people out there are going to be successful. We can't inter- in- invest in them. Their total available market is too small in that vertical and they're going to do fine. We just can't win in our, our game. Um, to appeal to those practical founders, you need to say, they, they literally need to be practical investors. Mm. We invest smaller chunks. We don't expect crazy growth rates. We expect reasonable growth rates. We'll help you with the things that you don't know that you need yet. Hiring senior help, building scalable go-to-market engines. Uh, you know, the, the, Those are things that are challenged as you move from startup to scale. Um, and we are relatively patient meaning we don't have to get our money back in five to seven years or we're going to start, you know, uh, making you do unnatural things. Uh, Most VCs would rather see a slow growing company fail than, you know, uh, keep, you know, keep it on the books for another uh, five years. It's just not the way their funds work. So, um, so growth equity and some private equity investors and some patient Practical capital, a lot of times from founders of the rest, says, you know, we will here, we're here to help. Uh, this could be your last round. That would be good. We like your efficiency. Um, you don't need to sell it right away. We see some opportunity. We think you're the guy. We're going to help you to run it. We don't, not going to push you out. Uh, we want all of our uh, investments to win. By the way, those things I just said, it's not how the traditional VC game works. So, got it. Well, Greg, this has been really fantastic advice for anybody thinking about how to build a sustainable, independent yeah. business, right? Achieve more control over the future of their business and potentially decide, right, whether you are ready for investment decisions, right? I think it's really important to highlight that you're not saying no. It's just the, yeah. like, like we said, it's an accelerant at the right stage at the right time when there's a perfect alignment. And I'm really, really glad that you're introducing this worldview, which doesn't get publicized in the press releases and in the tech tech media, but fundamentally could impact, you know, 95% of the actual people building. I'll take 90. People say, Oh, I'll let you have it. I said, well, I'll take 90% of the market. That's fine. You know, you so guys if you're take 90, if you're ninety percent of the market, you better be listening to this episode, <laughs> and you better be checking in. And Greg, how can people find you on LinkedIn? Obviously, yeah. Uh, but where else do you do you want to be found? Uh, they can connect with me and follow and join the conversation that's happening in my in my LinkedIn posts. And there's quite a crowd there. And uh, message me if you have a question. Uh, they can go to practicalfounders.com to find the Practical Founders podcast. Uh, download the ebook and uh, find out about peer groups that I do and other ways to get connected and uh, stay in part of this growing community. All right. It's global get... too. That's another thing too, is just as many founders in Europe and India and around the world who are building these kind of software companies as there are in the U S. So it isn't a Silicon Valley phenomenon or New York or London. It's everywhere else. So I'll take everywhere else. Yeah, this is highly relevant because the as the distribution channels have opened up and become more global, yeah. it sounds like the world of you know the the world of creativity is not limited to yeah. Silicon Valley. So thank you for advocating yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, we hope um, you dig in and download uh, the book. Thanks right. so much, Greg. Thanks, Alex.